So, Namaskar, good evening. So, uh, next part of the science of yoga, we are going to start today. I want to now go to, we were doing Yama, Niyama, Asana. Then we discussed Prana. Now we are going into the actual science of Pranayama, how it works and what it means. <clears throat> now, let me tell you in the, at the outset that we can't discuss all the different pranayamas. There are several pranayamas in uh, yoga. But before we do that, I want to once more, uh, not once more, I have to tell you why we are doing this pranayama. Now, uh, Ayurveda believes that we have uh, doshas, vata, pitta, kapha and so on, three doshas. And this, the combination of these doshas, when one is more and the other is less and so on, one gets disease. I mean, this is the Ayurvedic theory, it's not there in allopathy. But yoga says, the theory of yoga says, that disease is created by imbalance of the prana. Imbalance of the prana. Not imbalance of the doshas, which may be true according to Ayurveda. It is true actually, in a way. But Ayurveda strictly believes that, I'm sorry, uh, yoga, the understanding in yoga is that disease, physical and mental, and of course there is a disease called spiritual disease, we won't discuss it right now, is caused by the imbalance of uh, the prana. So then, we need to get into this understanding of prana and how it functions in the human body. And as I said in the previous classes, the prana that is in our system is not on exactly the breath, but it is the it is linked closely to breath. It's not purely just the breath, but it is linked to breath. And if you can control or you can uh, manipulate the uh, breathing, which is shwasa, you can also manip you can also control the prana. So if it is not flowing properly, you can make it flow properly through rhythmic breathing and different techniques which are adopted. Okay, so what is the theory of prana according to yoga? We tend to believe that. All the time we are breathing at the same rate through both the nostrils. We are not. I think somewhere I told you what to do to figure out which part of your nostril is working more than the other. I think I discussed it. I said keep a cell phone screen, not when it is ringing, or a glass piece under your nose and blow. You will find two blobs of vapor and invariably, except some, of course, there are exceptions. According to yoga, every 33 and a half minutes it shifts. Let us not go so accurately into this. But at every time you do this, you will find that generally one blob of vapor when you breathe out is bigger than the other. From this you judge that that part is working more than the other. Now we have to trace back to the left brain and the right brain. I said we discussed this before, that according to yogic anatomy and physiology, we have on the left side the nadi called the ida and the right side the nadi called the pingala. This we discussed. Now, <laughs> the Ida Nadi is supposed to be things to do with music, quietness um, um, and such things, you know, creative aspect of life. And the right Nadi, the Pingala, 
is to do with uh, eating, drinking, exercise, um, sex. All these things are linked to the Pingala Nadi. And in some way they are also linked to the brain because it's a well-known fact that the left brain when it is functioning at optimum levels brings about certain things much more perfectly and when the right brain is working at optimum level it brings about certain other things to optimum. Now, so therefore we link this. The Ida and the Pingala to the left brain and right brain and now I am proposing that we have a sufficiently uh, advanced neurologic, which is possible, neurological measurement uh, function, which is now possible in labs, by which you can measure the activities in the left brain and the right brain. And while you are using your Ida Nadi, which is connected to the left nostril, and Pingala Nadi, which is connected to the right nostril, see the changes that are taking place in the left brain and right brain. Now, as I said before, the left brain, uh, sorry, the left, uh, uh, the Ida, which is the left Nadi, is uh, linked to, let's say, uh, art, music, aesthetics and so on. So when that is functioning better than the other, you become more creative. So we are asking the question, is it possible to create a way by which the prana can be changed or handled to increase your creativity. Just to be, we know it is so, but we would like experimental basis for that, which you have to do. Or neurologists have to do, not, not so much you, but then you can link with some neurologist or somebody and try to work on it. Okay. So how do we check it? Keep the left Nadi functioning for a long time, say for 10 minutes, only left and see how your creativity increases, especially art, music and things like that. Now the right, the right nostril when it is open, the Pingala is functioning and when the Pingala is functioning, all activities that involve digestion, excretion, physical exercise, running, traveling, carrying weights, sex, having a bath, all these things are linked. So one needs to see if these are working better when the right nostril or the pingala is working, which can today using different scans in the lab, one can experiment, I haven't done it, but it can be done. I'm trying to work it out with neurologists so that we know that this is happening because nowadays people want proof. So here is the proof. look how it's functioning. Now, does it end there? No. If it is so, if. If the nadis and the nostrils our breathing is linked and if it can be changed, is it possible when you are doing, suppose I am doing a physical activity. Now, I am sorry you are young people but don't worry about it, you are not very young. Many people complain about sexual uh, inadequacy. What does yoga say about it? That probably at the time of having the experience of a sexual act or when you're doing these activities, probably instead of your pingala, uh, your, uh, the other nadi is working, Ida nadi is working. So the question is, so what? What can you do about it? 
We have no way to do it. How to shift? Yoga says there is a way to shift it. Now here is the secret of pranayama. One of the secrets. It is not very spiritual, but down to earth. So, yoga says that there are ways and means to shift from ida to pingala and pingala to ida. Depending on what kind of activity you are doing, you can shift from this to the other and the other. The other thing is, that is one thing. We will come to the techniques later. And not later, this, in this session I would like to look at that. Uh, the other thing is that the Ida Nadi is connected to cold, cool. Cools the system. And the Pingala Nadi is connected to heat. It heats the system. Some people complain that when they are meditating or doing some activity, their body is becoming very hot. They can't uh, handle it. They are sweating. That means, instead of the Ida Nadi, most of the time the Pingala is working. Which also means, in physical terms, that the right nostril is working more than the left most of the time. How do we turn it? How do we change it then? There is a technique by which you can shift the right breath and bring it to the left in about three minutes time. Come to the techniques later. So you see pranayama is not merely breathing in and out because that is also pranayama. It is the study of the prana and how to handle it. How to change it if necessary from Ida to Pingala and so on. Therefore, if a couple is not functioning sexually properly and if they want to function, if they want to, then the yogi would suggest that the male partner sleeps on the right and the female is sleeping on the left. So the wife the other partner is here, the friend, the male partner is here. Now what happens? When I turn to talk to the other person and when that person turns to talk to me, we are lying on one side for some time. The nadi or also the nostril on the opposite side on which you are lying becomes active. So, for men, after some time, the right nostril becomes active when you turn to the left. This is the technique coming. Coming to the technique. This is automatic. And in the female, is the opposite. She turns to this side to talk. So, again, the correct nadi which is supposed to work for her is working. And therefore, everything goes properly after a while. So the technique for changing the breath from the right to the left is if you want to open your right, lie down on your left side. Suppose your right nostril is blocked. Unless it is really blocked and you need a nasal drops, that's okay, but generally, if it is, if you find that this, use your blob experiment and if you think that the right one is working, needs to work more, it's the left that is working, lie down on your left side, opposite side. Then the right nadi begins to work in three minutes. If you want the left nadi to work, you're listening to music, you don't want action, turn to the right and lie down for a while. Very soon, this nadi will start working, the opposite nadi. Therefore, the opposite nostril. And then you are in the fit situation, optimum levels of enjoying the music. It can also be done by shutting one nostril and breathing through the other for some time. Even if you are sitting, after a while it will shift. There are other techniques in yoga of 
pressing the ankles and all, which we won't go into. This is enough. Two is enough. So, when they are perfectly balanced, when if suppose you blow and you get the exact blobs of the same diameter on your glass piece or on your cell phone, that means both are equally working. That is the time for spiritual things like meditation and higher things. So what happens is when the ida and the pingala are working at the same rate, at the same level, then your shushumna begins to function. Shushumna is the middle channel which flows from the bottom of the spine to the top of the head, to the cerebrum. Which means what? That it is connected to the cerebrospinal system, especially this, the uh, uh, spine and the uh, small little thread that is a continuation of the brain into the spine called the spinal cord. All the brain matter that is here is also there in the spinal cord, but it's a very thin thread going down to the bottom of the spine. In fact, if you look at anatomy, it is from this central bone, uh, spine, with its uh, uh, spinal cord, that nerve fibers come and form plexuses in the front. It is these plexuses which are almost in the same area as the chakras described by the yogis. Solar plexus, yes, Manipura chakra and so on. Sacral plexus, cardiac plexus, there are many. Now, therefore, when both are balanced, then the Shushumna Nadi is working. When the Shushumna Nadi is working, then we are not attempting anything in the physical world. We are trying to lift our levels of awareness to the higher levels, higher than physical. We describe this, we discuss this in detail. So, uh, what I am trying to say is that at the moment, our mind is in the level of the earth, Prithvi, which means it deals with three-dimensional world. And this three-dimensional world is connected to the Muladhara at the bottom of the spine. And the next center is between the navel and the Muladhara, which is the end of the spine. Between the navel and the end of the spine, which is called the Swadhisthana. It has the liquid tattva, which means subtler than the physical. The middle one called the Manipura, the solar plexus, solar heat, is the tattva of Agni, combustion, heat, tapasya, from where the solid and liquid state is further transformed into vapor through combustion, which means subtler state, symbolically, there is no vapor there. And then you come to the uh, Nahat, which is the heart center, here in the middle of the chest. Now that center is the center of Vayu, which means air, which means your awareness is shifting from the gross, which is solid, liquid to heat and then into vaporous state, like the wind. And then you have the Vishuddhi. Just behind this, the spinal center is called the Vishuddhi. In Vishuddhi, it is the center of Akasha. I explained some time back, this class or in Upanishad class, that Akasha, what Akasha means. Akasha means the primordial state from which all matter has differentiated itself. Which means primarily there is one frequency of vibration going on. These frequencies later combine and be, uh, uh, split, this frequency later splits into different frequencies. And all the states of matter we see and we don't see are only the different frequencies which have come from that one frequency. 
Now that one frequency, which is also the primordial substance of everything that we see, is called Akasha. <coughs> so the awareness shifts from the grossest, subtler and subtler and subtler to the most subtle point here. Then from beyond that, when it goes, there is no criteria in the physical world to understand or describe what it is in the Sahasrara. There it enters what is called the thousand petal lotus in the cerebrum. When the awareness reaches there, and when your conscious awareness is lifted up through the practice of pranayama and dhyana, dharna and dhyana, then you are ascended to a level from where you see the whole thing is one. All dualities vanish. There is one pure consciousness which is the witness of everything. For that, it has to climb, in most people laboriously, up the spine. Now that awareness which lifts up the energy to this, that energy is called Kundalini. If there is no snake sitting in the Mulagara, it's merely a symbol to show that like a coiled snake sleeping, it's resting and when you do certain pranayams, it is awakened and then it hood is up and it is moving up. Now, this snake symbol is not peculiar only to us. Even in medical science, the founder of medicine, Hippocrates, his symbol, which is even today used by allopaths, is a rod, winged rod with serpents going around. The winged rod is the Shushumna and the serpents going around are the Ida and the Pingala, which have to be equally balanced for perfect health. I mean, they are talking from the health point of view. We are talking from the spiritual health point of view, for, from incompleteness to completeness. So, as long as our consciousness and awareness are still in the level below the Vishuddhi, we are still in the three-dimensional world. When it has ascended beyond that, when our awareness is ascended beyond that, then we see different dimensions and experience different dimensions, which will be very difficult even to put forth in a three-dimensional world. It's even difficult to explain because we are looking at... Com now, I'll come to Pranam, please don't worry. Practical pranayam, even though I have described one or two, but we'll come to this. But I want to explain this. Why do I say that when we come to that dimension, we find it difficult to put it to others who stay in only with three dimensions? Well, it's a very free state, it's a liberated state where everything is one, there are no dual. Fine. These are words. But how do we put it to a person? Why can't we do it? I'll give you an example. Now, please listen carefully. Think of a glass box. Hmm? The glass box has a division in the middle. It has a bottom, but it has no top. Uh, it has a division, dividing wall in the middle, the glass box. It's an open glass box, like your shoe box but made of glass or perspex, completely transparent. It has no lid. And in the middle there is a division which is also transparent. Now imagine, see we know three dimensions. Can you imagine some creature? Imagine, use your imagination, which knows only two dimensions. It has no idea about a third. It is very thin. It is wafer thin. And it knows only movement this way or this way. It has not understood even that there is a movement like this or like this. Down to it can't go because there is a floor. But it hasn't understood that there is another movement up. It knows it's so thin. Think of small little uh, coins uh, made of plastic, wafer thin, little ones, which are moving this way, that way. And one side, there are the red ones. They are all colored red. Imagine. And the left side, they are all yellow. 
colored yellow. There are many. Now the red ones are aware that on the other side where the yellow ones are there, there is much more nutrition to eat and so on. Like virus, much more to consume. More human beings to attack. I mean, that is their food. We think it's a disease, right? For the virus, it's a livelihood. So, the red ones see that across the wall, which is transparent, there are these yellow fellows who have more freedom to move and more food to eat and they're enjoying themselves. But they don't know how to go there. Um, why? Because they don't know that there is a movement like this and then they can go. They know only this way. Two dimensions. It's exactly the situation when someone who has touched a fourth dimension is talking to a three-dimensional human being. Almost the situation. Okay. Now they also see, and so they are going on rushing, 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 these red fellows. Red fellows. Going on rushing, rushing, rushing. Trying to get into that side, but they don't know how to go like this. They are pushing, they are going, then some more are pushing. Going on. Now, there are one or two fellows who have pushed and pushed and pushed and have concluded that this is no way to go. Cannot. Because the dimensions are different, can't. So what do they do? They relax in one corner saying, okay, these fellows are trying, let's rest for a while. Now, while they are resting, they are not moving. Actually, there is somebody sitting and looking up, looking into the box, who can easily lift the red and put it on the side and turn them to the yellow. Once they go there, they will become yellow. Someone can do it. But how to do it when they are moving all the time? Not possible. These fellows who have tried and decided, no, this is no way, there must be something else and they are contemplating on it. Then there is no movement, so the fellow puts his hand and puts it on the other. They have gone there. They have become yellow also. And these reds are still wondering, how did the guys go there? There is nothing called movement up. There is only two side movements. I think mathematicians will understand this a little better. <coughs> So what happens to the red one, who finally the red ones who managed to go to the yellow side, is that they have understood that no physical activity can take them there and therefore they are contemplating. When they are contemplating, they are lifted to another dimension and thrown there, similar. <coughs> it is a similar situation. <coughs> Once the awareness goes beyond this, Vishuddhi, then you are in a different section, different dimension altogether, which is difficult to describe to somebody who has touched only three dimensions. Just as these two dimension fellows cannot understand the third, the three dimensions cannot understand the fourth. Unless you see those movies, what are the movies in which dimensions keep changing? I don't know what this movie is. Anybody? Doctor is strange. Huh? Doctor is strange, sir. <laughs> yeah, something like that. So, uh, Matrix. <laughs> Matrix. These are wonderful. Uh, uh, the Matrix is a wonderful idea for thinking process to figure out are there some other dimensions or not. Yogis say, yes, there are. And therefore, however rich we become, however powerful we become, however big we become, we are still in this dimension. We are not opening out into the fourth. And the glory of the fourth di dimension is the hard to describe. Shankara descri Shankaracharya describes this in a Saundari Lahiri, the ecstasy of beauty. And the Vedantist describes it as Satchit Ananda, blissful consciousness. And the yogi describes it as Kaivalya, 
which is there is complete oneness there is nothing else is complete quietness it's as if we are sitting alone on the shore of a sea and watching the waves no one to disturb you nobody is even selling moongfali on that beach so <clears throat> okay so we'll go, get back to pranayam i'm just trying to tell you the scope so first balancing the breath then cooling the body and the mind when the body and the mind uh, uh, please remember those experiments we discussed at some point we need to work on that how the right brain works when a certain nostril works and how the left brain is better when the other nose and so on now i also said the ida is the cool breath and the pingala is the hot breath so in summer try to have more of the cool breath and in winter try to breathe more with the hot breath this is how yogis survive in the himalayas hmm okay some breathing techniques which we need to discuss so two reasons why we need to learn pranayam and pranayam for your information is yama niyama asana next is pranayam the fourth part of patanjali yoga not only that even in yogas which are not strictly patanjalian people teach pranayam which is the buddhists have vipassana the only technique that buddha has ever taught is vipassana being aware of the breath and being aware of the body there is no thought no other technique then when somebody is initiated into the gayatri mantra and when you are doing the sandhya vandan suppose what do you do in between why are you doing this breathing in the middle of chanting the gayatri because unless and until the ida and the pingala are balanced your mantra chanting is not effective so this is so prana and apart from that the breath is the most important part of our nutrition it it's the key actually for everything we know how important it was only when covid came people couldn't breathe but actually at all times the most important thing is breath shwasa or prana use both words interchangeably and <coughs> it is such an important part of our nutrition but we don't give any attention to it you can live without food for some time you can live without what of us up time you cannot live without breath unless you are a yogi who has mastered the technique of breath you cannot live for more than a minute with it. even minute some people can't hold their breath or stop breathing such an important and without that the entire system where oxygen is taken in and carbon dioxide is given out will stop And this stops the blood is poisoned. Blood is poisoned, and that's the end. And since we are from the time we are in the womb till we die, this activity of breathing in and out goes on. Nobody says to us, "Breathe." We do we tell the lungs breathe? No. Lungs breathe by itself. It is it is controlled by the vagus nerve coming from the brain. from the sahasrara and it keeps breathing in and out and when it stops yeah you can resuscitate with a little oxygen and all that sometimes but generally finished off ho gaya finished no breathing puncher like a tube without air the bicycle tube so you see how important breath is and if we are not giving any attention to breath 
I am saying for a change, respect breath, give attention to it. You can avoid many diseases also with that, even physically. You see, when you see people dying, if they are healthy in all other ways, even then when they are about to die, the most, the biggest problem is their breathing. You see them taking a breath, grasping and finally, <laughs> breath is the last thing to move out. Breath is the first thing to come in to the system. And breath, therefore, is part of the universal prana, the life breath, which has been breathed into us from up above. In the Bible, it says the Lord created Adam and Eve and then breath, breathed the breath of life into their nostrils. I mean, this is just an example I'm giving. Vayu, prana, all this. Okay. So, <clears throat> I will give you a little of practical pranayam and then tell you a story about a great yogi and his control over the breath. Mm. First, the breathing to balance your in, ida and pingala. You don't have to be religious. You don't have to say, I'm going to attain moksha. This will be good even otherwise for you. But if you are interested in going to the higher levels of yoga, it is a very useful tool also. And this is called anulom vilom. Anulom bilom, you breathe into the one nostril first. Hmm? You breathe in through one nostril first. Take a deep, now breathing, how do you breathe in? Do we just do like this? Or do we take a long deep breath? Now what has happened? I have breathed in inside and the breath has to go also to the lower part of the lungs to keep your lungs healthy. What we somehow we have under this impression when you breathe in the chest should expand. Yes, chest should expand but also the diaphragm should expand. So in the first part of the deep breath take the breath down to the lungs. Fill your tummy. Then press your tummy in and bring it to the top part and expand your chest. Now when you breathe in with both nostrils, we'll come to that later, okay. So first, left or right, whichever you prefer, start with deep breath. Hold it for a count of three only to start with. Close your eyes, then stop the left nostril and breathe out very slowly. Not like that, but right now, what holding it there closed, breathe in again through the nostril through which you exhaled. Have you noticed one thing? When I breathe in through one nostril and hold the breath to the count of three, when I exhale through the other nostril. Now the, through the same nostril through which I exhale, I draw in again. Hold it for three counts and exhale through the other opposite nostril. And the same nostril from where I have exhaled, I draw that, inhale. This goes on. Alternately, this is alternate breathing in yogic terms, it's called anulom vilom. Now, of course, for different people, for different functions, for different things, 
the count is important how long it takes to breathe in how long you should hold and how long you should exhale i would say to start with inhale as comfortably as you can without forcing you don't count when you hold to start with count only 3 1 2 3 in your mind and exhale exhale also don't count exhale as softly and as completely as you can and then start inhaling through the same nostril only number you need to use is 1 2 3 when you are holding your breath because it is dangerous to hold your breath for too long and it is useless to not hold your breath at all therefore the count of 3 is safe to start with if you are already doing advanced pranayam is different you can do as you are doing anulom vilom now the important thing is while this balances your ida pingala after continuous practice nairantari abhyas in a regular practice it is necessary practice certain things will become clear to you one is your general health will improve since your breathing of oxygen in becomes more you are irrigating your system with oxygen so the the catabolic which is the destructive process in the cells will become less and your anabolic the creative process of your cells will increase so in general your metabolism will become balanced so this is the health effect if you do at least for 6 months not it's not a joke and sit in a well aired room if you are sitting outside on the terrace nowadays with all the vehicles putting their fumes into the air better you sit inside an ac and do it or do it in a garden where there are trees which absorb the carbon dioxide and let off oxygen the garden is best or in an open space where there are no there is no vehicle movement going on constantly therefore i suggest that it is done early in the morning so that nothing is still on mm-hmm. so now that is the physical effect mind effect since the ida and pingala are balanced our polarities are balanced and the mind becomes quiet now the important aspect of anulom vilom is not just the breathing but also to close your eyes and watch the breath as it comes in and as it goes out as you inhale and you exhale and you hold your breath give total attention forget about other things for the time being give complete attention to this is one pranayam simple anulom vilom alternate breathing now the next is what is called we call in kriya basic kriya as hang sa some people use so hum it doesn't matter but we say hang sa here we are not closing any nostril we keeping both the nostrils open and we are taking a breath we are inhaling holding for just the count of 3 exhaling little differences open your mouth slightly and exhale why is bre- long due to practice generally it's not so long and then again breathe in mouth closed hold breathe out with your mouth slightly open not hard like that slightly open is right so the other day i just taught this and turn around and there's one guy breathing like this watch out slowly cuz he thought it will work better so hold breathe out what is important here 
in, the, in Hamsa is to close your eyes and while you inhale, in your mind chant the sound of hum. Actually, when you breathe, you will feel as if it is hum. When you breathe out, you can actually whisper the sound of sa, if you like. Hum sa. Important thing is that your mind follows the inhalation and exhalation. Now, what happens? While it's good for health, it's also the other dimension, which is it makes the mind quiet. The vrittis settle down after a while. As you watch your breath and say hung sa, all the vrittis settle down and your mind becomes calm. When your mind becomes calm, your eyes are still closed, you will feel a pleasant feeling. Doesn't matter where, here, there, anywhere. It's wonderful and nice. Begin to enjoy that feeling. Try to understand that if I sit quietly, so after doing your pranayam, don't run away. Sit for two minutes quietly. And enjoy the atmosphere that you have created within you. This is the first step to what Patanjali calls chain moving the vrittis away from the mind. Which means at least for a short two minutes, there is no agitation of thoughts, conflicting thoughts, tension, nothing. Because now what happens when the mind is quiet? The brain works better, not in a mischievous way. The brain works better, the mind works better, the body works better, everything becomes optimal. These are the two pranayams which anyone. Now, let me tell you a story of a yogi and his breathing before you go. So that you must be tired of all this nonsense going on. So listen to a story. Everybody likes stories. There was a great yogi called Shama Charan Lehri who used to live in Banaras. He is the one who actually popularized Kriya Yoga. Hmm? And uh, because of him, Yogananda Paramahamsa wrote the autobiography of a yogi and so on. Uh, Kriya is also my parampara. So, uh, this uh, Yamacharan Lahiri retired from the accounts department of Western Railways and settled down in Banaras from Calcutta. He went. And uh, uh, he used to be popularly known, known as Lahiri Mahashar. Mahasha in, in Bengali simply means master. Teachers are also called Mahashas. So, Lehri Mahashai was in Banaras and one of his closest friend's sons joined the medical profession and became a doctor. So, he went to see, uh, his father said, since you are joining Banaras for work, my friend Lehri is there, go and see him. Take blessings from Masha, he's a great yogi. So go there. So he said, okay, he poor fellow didn't know anything. He was innocent or ignorant of all these things. So since he was going to join duty, he went with his doctor's bag with a stethoscope and everything. So he went and he did his uh, Pranams and said, I am so and so. Sir. Oh, he said, yes, yes, yes. So you have become a doctor, yes, he said. So he said, tell me, according to your medical profession, how do you know when somebody is dead? Well, he said, first thing is, breath stops, pulse stops, and after a while, the solar plexus also becomes cool. There is no heat there. Then we know that clinically the person is dead. We wait for a few minutes. Then we say, okay, person is clinically dead. We try to revive the breathing. Well, if it doesn't work, it's over. Okay, he said. He said, now I want, you have your stethoscope with you. Yes, sir. Oh, he said, take it out and keep it ready. I'm going to do something. Please check me. He said, okay. So, Lehri Mahasha sat in Padmas and he was always sitting in, did a little couple of breaths and became silent. 
all of us. He had told him, when I become quiet, I'm not breathing, doing anything conscious, test me. He did. He took out the stethoscope and he checked him. No breathing. Checked him from the back, from the front. No breathing may be possible for a minute, but two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, no breath. He got worried. Then he checked the pulse, no pulse. Slowly checked the solar plexus, it has cooled down. Ice cold. He thought he's gone. He said, why did this man try to die himself? <laughs> he didn't know, but he's dead. Clinically, he's dead. He started shouting loudly. Anybody here in us, everybody came. What happened? He told me to do this, I have done it. He's in clinically, according to me, he's dead. No other things are happening. So the family people said, please don't panic, rest, keep quiet for a while, he'll come back. They said, no, it's impossible to, just sit down. Sat. After five minutes or ten minutes, eyes opened and he breathed. And he said, so you still insist that this is how death comes to you? <laughs> He said, sir, from our point of view, this is how it is, but this is something which I don't know, I don't understand. Then he said, this is a science, also like your science, and unless you know, learn and practice, you will not understand. So, try to learn it if you can. All the best, God bless you and send him off. Why I'm saying this because we are dealing with the science of pranayam. I would suggest that we conclude the session today. Hmm? Uh, whatever questions you have for today's session, please write them down and keep it for you. Tomorrow we will deal with tomorrow's sessions, questions and today's session because both are pranayam. So, uh, please think about it carefully and note down all the questions you may have some questions practical theoretical anything is fine and we'll work on them tomorrow I want this one hour session to last you go back you'll keep thinking of those little wafer like creatures walking up and down trying to jump huh? okay thank you very much Namaskar Om Shanti Shanti Thank you.